This world is filled with crimes, murders, and injustice. One of the most disturbing crimes out there is killing a complete stranger. Someone who you have no grudge with, someone that you don't personally know, someone who's done nothing to you whatsoever. Killing a complete stranger is the things that nightmares are made of because it means that any of us could have been the victim. In one of Knoxville, Tennessee's most horrific crimes, Shannon Christian and her boyfriend, Christopher Newsom, were not only robbed, they were beaten, kidnapped, and raped all in one night. The murders in this case crossed all boundaries of morality and ethics when they killed two complete strangers who had done nothing to them in the most grotesque, evil, merciless way possible. Hello and welcome back to True Crime Tea Time. I'm your host, Lovely T. So haunting, so chilling, come quick, the tea here is spilling. If you want it, then come to me, discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. Lamarcus Devell Davison was a very dangerous man, and in 2006, he was released from prison after serving time for carjacking. LaMarcus was facing a lot of financial problems in his life ever since his release from prison. He was used to fast money from selling drugs. So him working a regular nine to five job, he really did not like it because he was not making as much money that way. So he was basically living paycheck to paycheck. He didn't even have enough money to afford his own car. The only thing he was able to do was rent a small house in the hood and he was basically almost unable to afford that. So what he ended up doing was allowing some of his friends and his younger brother to move in with him to help him pay some of the bills. The address of his rental property was 2316 Chapman Street. His younger brother named Latavius Rome Cobbins decided to move in with him from Kentucky. Now on top of his brother moving in with him, he also bought two friends who were also struggling and homeless. So the two friends that he brought in to move into LaMarcus's house was George Giovanni Thomas and his girlfriend, Vanessa Coleman. LaMarcus agreed because he thought that, you know, the three people moving in with him would help him with his bills and help, you know, just alleviate a lot of his stress. But that's not what happened. They were basically bums themselves. They were nothing but freeloaders. They moved from Kentucky all the way to Tennessee to basically live off of LaMarcus. And after a while, LaMarcus started feeling away. Like, I'm already struggling on my own. I just got released from prison. I can barely pay my bills. And now I have not one but three freeloaders living with me. This is insane. So basically, after a while, LaMarcus was really annoyed by the three of these people. People. He felt like they were nothing but freeloaders. They didn't appreciate anything. They didn't clean up. They literally did nothing in his home but just take up space. So after a while, there was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of back and forth. The group of people, including his brother that moved into his home, did nothing but irritate him. So in January of 2007, LaMarcus finally decided to get himself a car. He was tired of taking the bus or walking to wherever he had to go. Because remember, he was a pretty big time drug dealer at one point. So he had all the traffic. He had the clothes, he had the women, he had the cars, and now he had nothing. So he felt like at this point, he wants to get back to where he used to be before he went to prison. So instead of working hard and saving his money, that was just too much like, right. He decided on that day in January, he was gonna get him a car no matter what. He asked his brother Latavis and another friend of his, Eric Dwayne Boyd, to help him jack a car. And of course, the other two, they really had nothing else to do. So they were like, sure, we'll come and help you, you know, steal somebody else's car we're not doing anything else here besides freeloading so they followed him on this mission to go steal themselves a car so on the night of january 6 2007 the three of them homed in on their target there was a young couple in an apartment complex they were basically in the parking lot and so they started just hugging each other and giving each other kisses and warm embraces and everything else so at that point, LaMarcus saw them and he felt like, you know what, this is the perfect couple. They'll have no idea that we're about to run up on them. We'll catch them unexpectedly and just take their car and drive off. So that was the plan, but that wasn't what happened. As they're hugging and kissing each other, all of a sudden, a shadow of a man walks up behind them. 
he walks up behind them and he pulls out a gun. So now these two are staring at the barrel of a gun. But then all of a sudden, some headlights from an SUV start shining on them and LaMarcus gets really scared. So then what happens is that he gets really panicked and he ends up shoving the couple into the back of Shannon's SUV. So that way they wouldn't be spotted by the cars that were driving by. Once he forced the couple inside, they basically tied their hands together and all three suspects took the two kidnapped victims to 2316 Chipman Street. So at this point, LaMarcus is really frustrated. All he wanted was the car. He didn't mean to take the car and then end up bringing this young couple to his home. So now at this point, this couple is witnesses. They see the inside of his home. They see LaMarcus and the rest of their faces. And he feels like something has to be done. He can't just let this couple leave in the same way that they came to his home. So what followed next was nothing but unimaginable horror. The couple were super scared. Their hands were tied behind their backs. They couldn't talk. They didn't know what to think. And most importantly, they didn't recognize any of these people. They didn't know any of these guys. They didn't go to college with them. They didn't know them from high school. So they were really shook like, who are these people that kidnapped us? What did we do? We were literally in a parking lot, you know, embracing. And now we're in this house with these three people. And we have no idea why we're even here. So now I wanna go ahead and talk about the victims and explain to you who they were exactly. They were a young white couple and they were complete strangers to this evil group of people. Their names were Shannon Gill Christian and Hugh Christopher Newsom. Most people just called Christopher Chris. He was beloved by everybody who knew him. The couple were in love. They had just started dating. She was born in Texas on April 29th, 1985. And throughout her childhood, she spent most of her childhood in Louisiana. She ended up moving to Knoxville, Tennessee around 1997. She was a bright young girl who went to Fairgott High School. After she graduated in 2003, she ended up going to college at the University of Knoxville where she was studying sociology. She had one more year left of college before she was gonna graduate from her major. And she was super excited about that. Now her boyfriend was Hugh Christopher Newsom. He was two years older than Shannon and they had been together for just a few months. He was born on September 23rd, 1983. He was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee and everybody who knew him really, really enjoyed Chris. He had a great sense of humor. He played all types of sports, but his favorite sport was baseball. He graduated high school in 2002 and he became a carpenter after attending Felicity State Technical Community College. Even as a carpenter, he never lost his sporty side. He would still attend baseball games. He loved to go fishing and he also loved to golf. He was a remarkably fun person, hence why Shannon fell head over heels over him and started dating him as soon as possible. Chris had tons of friends in Knoxville who had known him since childhood. So when Chris disappeared, his presence was definitely missed and people definitely felt like something wasn't right. So on January 6, 2007, while LaMarcus and his crew were looking for a car to take, Chris and Shannon were scheduled to be at a birthday party. Chris had planned the perfect night out. First, they had decided to go to dinner and spend some time with each other. And then after dinner, they had planned on attending a birthday party of a close friend. It was around 8 p.m. when Chris came to pick up Shannon from a friend's house. The two of them headed to the parking lot to go take Shannon's car because they were planning on driving her car to the party. But before they got into their car, they decided to, you know, just hug on each other, you know, kiss each other and give each other a warm embrace because they didn't want to do all that PDA in front of Shannon's friend in the apartment building. So while they're cuddling and, you know, catching up with each other, that is when the silhouette of a stranger appeared before the two of them and the stranger had a gun. So Shannon and Chris were terrified. They had no idea who these men were, where they came from, and most importantly, they did not know what these men wanted with them. They soon found themselves in this man's home with their hands tied and they were surrounded by LaMarcus, George Thomas, Vanessa Coleman, Latavis Cobbins, and Eric Boyd. Shannon and Chris were sexually and physically assaulted. Christopher was not only tortured, but he was also raped and sodomized. The men punched and kicked him repeatedly. His optop he also showed that his head and his eyes were covered, his mouth was covered, and his limbs were tied behind his back. So after being constantly beat, kicked, raped, and sodomized, the four men decided to take Chris out of the home. They threw him in the back of the truck and they decided to go on a ride with Chris in the back of the vehicle. Chris was barefoot and they put a dog leash around his neck. 
While Chris was being tortured and dragged, the female companion, Vanessa, was holding Shannon captive in the north bedroom of the house. The men took a gun with them and they made Chris walk on a nearby railroad track with no shoes on. And mind you, this was in the dead of winter. This was January in Tennessee. So it's pretty cold out. This poor man literally walked on the tracks with his feet tied together, with his hands bound. He wasn't able to see or anything. He couldn't even cry out for help because they had blindfolded him and they put a sock in his mouth. So you can only imagine what he was going through, what he was thinking. He's outside in the cold, he's barely dressed, he's barefoot, and he's walking on railroad tracks. So I'm sure this man was petrified to death of what was about to happen to him. But while he was walking, the men pulled the trigger twice. They made sure to shoot him in a spot where he wouldn't die instantly. So he fell onto the railroad track and he's just, you know, basically rolling around in pain and angst and, you know, he's hurting. But at the same time, he can't scream. He can't cry out because his mouth is gagged. So after they watched him struggle in pain and agony, they finally decided to end his misery by taking a a gun, putting it to his head, and pulling the trigger. The autopsy later revealed that the gun at the time of being shot was pressed right against his head and the bullet went right through his brain stem, killing him instantly. So now after the men had had their so-called fun with Christopher, they knew they had to get rid of the evidence, they had to get rid of the DNA. So what they did is that they basically wrapped Christopher's body up in a blanket then they set him on fire right there on the railroad tracks. They left his body to burn and they basically jumped back in the car and went home like nothing ever happened. So once they got home, they realized, okay, you know what? We have one more victim. We have to figure out what to do with her. We can't have her just being here at the house. Unfortunately for Shannon, what happened to her boyfriend is gruesome and as horrible as that was, that was only a taste of what they had planned on doing to Shannon. They went on continuously beating and raping her for 24 hours straight. Different parts of her body were not only subjected to rape, they were also subjected to a lot of trauma as well. Her autopsy revealed that she received several carpet burns, she had a lot of bruising on her, she also suffered a lot of trauma around her genital area due to not only the torment of being raped, but also also being beaten. These men took turns kicking her over and over in her vagina. They took turns kicking her in her mouth. She was bruised so bad in her vagina that she had hemorrhaging all over it. And that was not enough for these sadistic bastards. Basically on top of doing all of that to Shannon, they then took the leg of a broken chair and proceeded to insert it inside of Shannon over and over and over again. So now after they proceeded to not only rape her physically, you know what I'm saying, themselves, they raped her with all types of different objects in every orifice. The craziest part is they then decided we have to get rid of all this DNA evidence. We can't have our DNA on her body. Mind you, Shannon is still alive at this point. She's not dead. So she's feeling all of this. She's screaming out in pain. She's crying. They're ignoring her cries. They then proceed to pour bleach on her. So imagine she's already just been, you know, done any type of way. She has all types of open scars, open bruises, everything. And they start pouring bleach on her vagina because they wanna kill all of the DNA. On top of them pouring bleach on her vagina and on her body, they then instruct Shannon to drink the bleach. And Shannon has no choice. She drinks the bleach and the bleach starts making her incredibly sick. Shannon is being tortured even worse than poor Christopher at the railroad tracks. So as they made her inject the bleach, which has nothing but toxic chemicals in it, they're continuing to basically, you know, wash her off with bleach. They're inserting bleach in and out of her orifices and she's just screaming in pain. Now, according to LaMarcus at trial, he kept saying that Shannon was crying out, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. But that didn't stop LaMarcus or his psychopathic brother or the other psychopathic friends that were with him from carrying on with the torture, even though this young girl kept begging them for her life and kept begging them and telling them that she didn't want to die. They weren't trying to hear any of it. The evidence later on revealed that they had hogtied Shannon and they hogtied her with curtains and bed sheets. Then they went on to tightly wrap small trash bags around Shannon's head. She was then discarded and placed in a large plastic garbage can. And mind you, Shannon is still alive at this point. She's still breathing. 
Poor Shannon was left there alone, gasping for air, the whole time probably thinking to herself, what did I do? Who are these people? Why am I in this situation? Shannon died a very painful death. She stayed in that garbage can the rest of the night where she bled from her orifices and slowly suffocated to death. The autopsy revealed that she died sometime between January 7th and January 8th, literally a full 24 hours after she had been kidnapped. Shannon was only 21 years old. The family and friends of Chris and Shannon became very, very disturbed because they never showed up to the party that they were supposed to attend on the 6th of January. According to friends and family, that wasn't normal of the two to just, you know, not show up. So many people kept calling them, texting them, but they never responded and that wasn't normal either. So around 11 p.m. on the day of the party, two of Chris's friends became increasingly worried about him, so they decided to go to the apartment complex to make sure that nothing had happened. And when they got there, they saw Chris's vehicle, but no one could find Shannon's SUV. The sun rose the next day and Shannon's mother grew even more anxious with every passing moment. Shannon's manager had also called the mother and informed her that Shannon didn't arrive to work and that was not like Shannon to not show up to her job. So eventually on January 7th, she decided to go forward and file a missing person report. On top of filing the missing person report, friends and family of both Shannon and Christopher also caught the hospitals. They caught the police department. They just wanted an answer to what happened to this couple. Were they in an accident? Were they on the side of the road somewhere? They just wanted people to be aware that these two beautiful people were missing. So on the day that Shannon's missing person report was filed, two rail workers on the railroad tracks basically found a body. They didn't know who the body belonged to, so they hurried up and they caught the police because the body was also burnt. So they felt like this might have been some type of murder situation, as opposed to somebody getting ran over by the train. The police came and the medical examiner's office came and took the body away. Shortly after them getting the body off the railroad tracks, they were able to extract the DNA and the DNA matched to Hugh Christopher Newsom. Now when they examined him, they found semen in his anal cavity, but because of the deterioration of the body, because the body was burnt, they weren't able to pull enough DNA sample from the semen that was found in Chris's body. So at this time, Shannon is telling the police that she wants them to do a manhunt for her child. They gotta find Shannon. And right now the police are like, well, it hasn't been a full 48 hours yet. We're not gonna do a manhunt. You know, she could just, you know, have went out of town. She's just not around right now. We're not gonna go ahead and waste any resources right now looking for somebody who we don't think is in any type of danger. It's very interesting sometimes how the police end up dropping the ball very early in a lot of these cases. So anyways, the mother refuses to wait for the police. She's like, I'm looking for my daughter. I don't care what the police say. Her and Shannon's friends, they keep trying to ping the phone. Eventually they get a hit. The phone ends up pinging a phone tower on Cherry Street. So the friends and family go down there and they eventually find her abandoned car on Gilder Avenue sometime around 2 a.m. in the morning of January 8th. When they examine the car, it only made them realize that the worst had happened. The front seats of the car were pushed back so much that it would have been impossible for Shannon to be the one driving it because she wouldn't have been able to reach the pedals. On top of that, the floorboards were super dirty. They were covered in mud, which was very unusual because Shannon was kind of a neat freak. She always kept her car very immaculate, very clean. So they were shocked that her car was that filthy. On top of that, Shannon also had stickers that were on the outside of her car, but for some reason, those stickers were missing. So that raised a lot of red flags for the family. They also noticed that in the car, some of her belongings were missing. That included her phone charger, her iPod, her teddy bear, and also something that was strange. There was a pack of Newport cigarettes in her car, but neither Shannon or Christopher smoked. So that also raised alarms for the family as well. So while going through everything, they end up finding the envelope in her car. And it was very strange because the envelope was not addressed to Shannon or her boyfriend. So they went to, you know, dust for fingerprints on the envelope and the fingerprints on the envelope matched to somebody else. When they ran the address on the envelope, it showed that the address of the person who owned the envelope was literally two blocks away from the murder scene. The address was 2316 Chipman Street. They knocked on the door on Tuesday, the 9th of January, but nobody was at home. So because the police had a sinking feeling, 
they decided to basically force themselves into the home and they started searching through all of the belongings. They finally found a dead body in the plastic bin and when they opened the bin, it was the body of Shannon Gale Christian. She was unclothed from the waist down. She was wearing only a camisole and a sweater. The search finally came to an end, but the gruesome events of how she got into that garbage bin was gonna come to light in the future. Now, what was interesting is that the belongings that were missing from Shannon's car, they were found in LaMarcus's home. In addition to Chris's baseball cap, remember I said earlier that Chris was an avid baseball player, even as he got older, they found Chris's baseball cap in LaMarcus's home. So if LaMarcus didn't know either one of these people, why would he have their items in their home? Shannon's body was sent for a medical examination and what the autopsy found was so horrific. LaMarcus's fingerprints were detected on the trash bags. His semen was also discovered in her body. And fortunately, despite them using blue bleach to clean her up, the medical examiners were also able to match the DNA of his half-brother Latavis Cobbins. His DNA was found on Shannon's jeans and his DNA was also found on her camisole and sweater. Another thing they found is that there were a lot of gun shells present at the house and these gun shells were the perfect match for the bullets that were pulled out of Christopher's head. Now with all the evidence pointing towards LaMarcus, the police started to track down their prime suspect. On January 11th, the cops found Latavis and George Thomas in Lebanon, Kentucky. They were enjoying the news about LaMarcus and the murders. They also found LaMarcus's other accomplice, Eric Boyd. Without any hesitation, he disclosed his location. And finally, LaMarcus DeVell Davison was arrested on January 11th, 2007. According to some reports, he was hiding on a home on Reynolds Street. And when he was arrested, he had a 22 caliber revolver on him. The prime suspect in this case, LaMarcus, was constantly changing in his story. Now handcuffed, LaMarcus had nowhere to run and basically he wanted to give an account of what happened during the murders. He named George Thomas and Latavis Cobbins as the criminals who did all this. He told the cops that Thomas and Cobbins came to his house on January 6th or 5th around 10 p.m. and they told him that they had just carjacked two people. LaMarcus stated that he saw Shannon and Chris tied up in the back seat of the car. He said that he'd left since he did not want to get involved. He then later on admitted to using Shannon's SUV for his drug dealing activity. He also said that he was inside the house but never raped Shannon. Of course, nobody was buying his story because they had solid DNA evidence against him. So basically, LaMarcus was full of shit. The rest of the squad were also arrested on the same day. Vanessa, George, and Latavius were taken into custody for their involvement in both murders. Latavius was questioned by the cops and he gave new details about the night of the murders. He claimed that initially when LaMarcus asked for his hand in the carjacking, he said he argued with him telling his brother not to go, but you know, the brother decided to go anyways. He also said that LaMarcus and Eric Boyd were the two who pointed the gun at the couple. He further added that Eric was the one who drove Chris to the railroad tracks. Everyone except Boyd was charged with murder. Eric Dwayne Boyd was declared an accomplice in the killings and he was given a maximum of 18 years on April 16, 2008. So the trial of LaMarcus, Latavis, and George Thomas and Vanessa Coleman was scheduled for August 25th, 2009. Even though Latavius tried to distance himself, they realized that Latavius was in this just as deep as his brother. So Latavius was found guilty on August 25th of 2009. He was charged with first degree murder. They ended up reading his charges out loud. I ain't got no reason to, to, to lie. I don't, I have nothing to lose by telling y'all the truth and what happened. The DA has already put on their proof about my DNA being on that girl. I can't deny that. Yes, my DNA was on that girl. I, I, I did have oral sex with that girl. I can't deny that. He ended up getting sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On top of that, he was only 24 years old when he got involved with this murder. He was also found guilty of aggravated robbery, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated rape, and theft. In June of 2010, he was given an additional sentence of 80 years, and he was at this time 28 years old. Just like LaMarcus, George Thomas was also facing a total of 46 charges. He was convicted of all charges, 
and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Thomas was 24 years old at the time. Now for the female in the clique, her name was Vanessa Coleman and Vanessa Coleman's trial happened to be last. She tried to play victim in this situation. She was everything. She was an abused spouse. She was a runaway. She just had all of these excuses for why she was there and down with the murder. Now what's crazy is that while she's trying to play victim and act like she was forced there under duress, the sheriff's department ended up finding a diary at her home when they did a raid on her home. And in that diary, this is what she says. Dear diary, last night was one of a kind. We stayed with a crackhead that is cool as hell. It snowed a little, but it's already melted. Let's talk about the adventures. I had one hell of an adventure since I've been in big Tennessee. It's a crazy world these days, but I love the fun adventures and lessons that I've learned. And it's gonna be a long, interesting year. On May 13, 2010, she was found not guilty of first degree murder, but was sentenced on July 30th, 2010, to 53 years behind bars. Now there was also a lot of drama with this case, especially in the public and on social media. As gruesome and as brutal as this case was, believe it or not, it did not get a lot of coverage. A lot of people in the community were feeling like the reason why this did not get a lot of coverage Granted, they talked about it was big in Tennessee, but it wasn't really a huge national story, like some of the stories that captivate us. And a lot of people feel like the reason why it wasn't was because the victims were white and the perpetrators were black. Many people were calling out the double standards. They felt like this should have been a hate crime because the victims did not know any of these black people. They were chosen randomly and they were tortured and killed in the most heinous ways. But none of these people were charged with a hate crime. So a lot of people were upset about this, even brought out a lot of white supremacists and KKK people. They were out there protesting. But the family did not want anything to do with that. They did not want white supremacists and racist people getting involved in their plight. They didn't want the plight of their children being overshadowed by a bunch of racial drama. They didn't care the race of the perpetrators. They just wanted justice for their children. Uh, members of various groups, particularly white supremacy groups, trying to use the case and the lack of coverage as uh, indication that it's because you have black suspects and white, and white victims. I have heard that there's been some some people that have talked about how um, you know it was a, a racially motivated crime and I think that you know, it's a bad thing because that just creates more racism and intolerance and um, I guess strife between in the community. I don't think it had anything to do with race. I think it was just they, that's who they saw and they went after him. From what we've read and what we know about some, some of them, because some of the people in the community know some of the, the suspects, that they've always had a life of crime. They were always unstable, and they were always into something. And I do believe firmly, and some of the people that I run along with, that when you practice a lot of deceit, and when you're involved in a lot of things like that, it's going to catch up with you. And I think it caught up with them. I don't believe that it had... Um a negative effect on the African American community as a whole because the African American community is not responsible for the acts of a few uh, individuals who went past the bounds of human decency. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if this person is black, white, Asian, Latino, they lost their life and they deserve the utmost respect. Their story should be told. Now, after LaMarcus Davison's verdict was read, Judge Richard Boomgartner informed him of the method of execution, saying, the state imposes the penalty of death by lethal injection. May you find peace with your maker. LaMarcus became the 90th person to be sentenced to death in Tennessee. The trials were officially over. The friends and family of the victim were finally able to move and get closure. Shannon's mother, Dina, said in the family's press conference that Christian and the Newsoms got justice today. The families also expressed their gratitude to the court and the jury for honoring the two victims, Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. They were very much loved by all of those around them. And after their deaths, the two were honored with a charity foundation and a baseball scholarship. The Shannon Gale Christensen Fund was set up in her name. Its purpose was to prevent suspects from making false statements that could present a bad image of the victim. Because one of the killers falsely testified that Shannon came to buy drugs. 
and a baseball scholarship was established at the high school that Chris went to in 2014. The House of Horrors, where Shannon and Chris were tortured and raped and, you know, just went through it. And they ended up demolishing that house and they put up a memorial for the two victims. So that is what stands in that place now. It's no longer a house. And the sad thing is this was one of those crimes where the victim honestly did not even know what they did or what was happening to them. I could only imagine the fear and what was running through their head because again, they don't recognize these guys. These guys are complete strangers and yet they're beating on them. They're raping them. They're doing all types of horrific stuff to them. And Shannon and Chris had done nothing to these people. The savage torment that the couple were subjected to, you know, just leaves a question in your psyche of these offenders. If all they wanted was a car, how did they go from going to go jack and take a car to basically taking two precious people away from people who loved and cared about them? Like, how does it go from that extreme? You know, you go to go jack a car, but not only do you kidnap this innocent couple, you end up raping and torturing them and literally burying one alive in a garbage can. I mean, this is insane. Like that really is the epitome of escalating quickly. And I think the saddest thing is as well is that a lot of the media ignored this death. You know, some people say it was due to the race of the victims, but either way, I think everybody's death should be reported on fairly and accurately. Regardless if the perpetrators are black, white, Asian, or Hispanic, that should not matter. It should be about the victims. It should be about telling the victim's story and getting it out there. So that way people can learn from these stories and take better precautions to protect themselves if they ever find themselves in this type of situation. So let me know what you guys think about LaMarcus Davison and his crew. Do you feel like maybe they have been planning on killing these people from jump, but they just claimed that it was supposed to be a robbery because every Everything that happened to this couple just seemed very, very calculated, very, very evil and demonic. I don't feel like this just happened spur of the moment. I think at some point in time where they were riding around to go looking for a car to jack, they decided that whoever they took the car from that day, they were gonna kill. At the end of the day, these people were the definition of spree killers. They found a couple that they did not know, they've never had any interaction with, and they took out all their frustration and anger on this couple. Even though spree killing is a very rare phenomenon, it does happen. And most spree killers tend to feel as if they no longer belong in society. They also become really alienated towards other people. They start to grow a lot of resentment and animosity, which LaMarcus was definitely feeling in that household with the other three people who were living with him or so-called freeloading off of him. On top of that, spree killers also feel like their life has amounted to nothing. LaMarcus was in and out of jail. He couldn't really hold his steady job. He was basically living from paycheck to paycheck. He was one step away from being homeless. And so when you have all of these emotions combined into one, unfortunately, you can get what they call a spree killer. They tend to kill based off of emotions and they tend to kill once they've been triggered. And I feel like that's what makes this whole situation even scarier. The fact that neither Shannon or Christopher knew their perpetrators, did anything to them. They had never seen each other before that night. To know that such a young couple, ages 21 and 23, lost their life in such a gruesome way, and then in death they weren't covered and their case wasn't respected as it should have been, I think that whole situation is sad. But all of these people ended up getting a lot of time in prison. So now an update on the case that's very interesting. In 2019, LaMarcus Davidson was begging the court for a new trial because he's currently on death row and he's supposed to be sentenced to death. It's been about 12 years since these young people were killed and LaMarcus feels like he doesn't want to die now. He wants to, you know, live the rest of his life in prison. He shouldn't receive the death penalty. And the judge chose otherwise. They refused to let him get a new trial and they are keeping him on death row where he should be. Tennessee Appeals Court finds the mistakes were made, but not enough to overturn the guilty verdict and the death penalty for the alleged ringleader in the Christian Newsom murders. Marcus Davidson was found guilty and sentenced to death in those 2007 killings. In the long legal process that has followed, his case has gone from appeals court to the state Supreme Court and now back to the lower court of appeals. Judge Norma McGee said that the New Testament from a co-defendant was relevant to the case, but it would not have changed the jury's mind about the death penalty, calling the error, quote, harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. That new testimony came in 2019 when co-defendant George Thomas testified that it was Eric Boyd, not Davidson, who shot Chris Newsom. 
Now, Judge Ogle also agreed that Davidson's defense team made mistakes, including not asking to have the trial moved, but she didn't find that Davidson could prove that he was prejudiced by their performance. Now, a total of five people, including Davidson, have been convicted in the shocking murders of Shannon Christian and Chris Newsom. Four people eventually convicted in the kidnapping and killing of a young Knoxville couple in 2007 is seeking a new trial. Let Alvis Cobbins is serving a life prison term with no parole allowed. He was convicted nearly two years ago in the slaying of 21-year-old Shannon Christian and of facilitating the murder of her 23-year-old boyfriend, Christopher Newsom. Cobbins' attorney will argue at a hearing on Thursday that the court erred in allowing his evidence photographs which showed the horrific injuries the couple received, according to the Knoxville News Sentinel. The defense also is challenging the legality of a search warrant used to gain access to the house where the couple were held captive. Story, no parole for a woman sentenced in one of the worst murder cases in Knoxville's history. The shocking killings of Shannon Christian and Chris Newsom stunned our community in 2007. Now, nearly 14 years later, court proceedings continue to give the family little rest. Today, both the Christians and Newsoms testified on why the parole board should vote to keep one of the suspects behind bars. WATE 6 on your side reporter Austin Martin followed this morning's hearing for us. Austin. Well, Vanessa Coleman was back in front of a parole board for the second time today. Six years ago, she asked to get out of prison, but was denied. Today, the board agreed she still hasn't served enough time. Someone many years ago made a statement that time heals all wounds. I'm here to testify today that that statement is false. And the person that made that statement originally never buried a child. Gary Christian speaks from experience. Nearly 14 years ago, his daughter Shannon and her boyfriend Chris Newsom carjacked, raped, and murdered. Five people have been convicted. Over that time, there have been trials and retrials. In the last 13 years and 11 months, we've been in court well over 350 times. We heard over 190 pre-trial motions before any of the trials began and finally attended every session of eight trials. Today, Hugh Newsom added to that count. Vanessa Coleman, who was convicted and sentenced to 35 years for facilitating crimes, asked to get out of prison. It was a game to her. When you run with criminals, you become one. Um, my parents are still married and they live in Kentucky. And um, that would be my home plan to live with them while I work and save my money until I am able to move out on my own. That's the way she wants to spend her time. As two dads watch and wait, the parole board makes a quick decision. It's clear to me in the record today that you play a vital and significant role facilitating and promoting these awful crimes. Uh, Ms. Coleman, you have seven votes to decline your parole due to the seriousness of the offense for the next 10 years. Justice still served. I always find it funny when people want to plead for their life, when all of a sudden, you know, they don't want to die. But yet and still, they had no problem taking somebody else's life, hence why he's in the situation that he's in. Also, Eric Boyd, they suspected for a long time that Eric Boyd was the one who raped Chris and put the dog leash on his neck. He tried to ask for a new trial in 2022 because he was sentenced to 22 years. So he wanted a lesser sentence because he feels like he was young. Uh, he was under duress. He shouldn't have gotten that much time. And they denied him a new trial as well. Too. The families of Chris Newsom and Shannon Christian say they've waited more than a dozen years for this day. Eric Boyd is the fifth suspect charged in the crimes tied to the killing of that young Knox County couple back in 2007. Today, jurors found Boyd guilty on 36 counts. Shannon Christian and Chris Newsom were attacked in their SUV in the parking lot of an apartment complex on a Saturday night in January of 2007. And for his role, Boyd will now die in prison. He will be 99 years old by the time he is eligible for parole. Boyd had been convicted as an accessory after the fact for the crime, one of the worst in Knox County history. 
Now he'll be in prison for murder for at least 51 years, eligible for parole when he's in his late 90s. So I'm super happy that both of these men were denied new trials. My thing is they made their bed. They had no sympathy. They had no empathy for the victims. They killed two complete strangers who had done nothing to them. And now they want the courts and they want the people of Tennessee to have mercy on their soul. I think not. Enjoy your time on death row. The other one, enjoy life in prison. So on that note, you guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in to True Crime Tea Time. Stay safe, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.